If you'd turn in your Bibles now to Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to do some condensing. And though it says this is our last installment here in Ephesians, uh, it's, that's not true, even though I typed it. Because uh, we'll, we'll, we'll never get through what we have to get through in light of all the other things that we've got going on today. So uh, we will have a, a yet one more piece here uh, in the armor, these offensive weapons, spiritual warfare. Today, part five. And we'll be looking at, at this amazing sword that we're able to wield, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. So many Christians in their existence in this world really uh, go around as if they're unarmed. And part of that is because there, there is very little attention in their own personal life to the Word of God. Uh, it's wonderful that we all gather together on Sundays and Thursdays and maybe lady study and men study and all those kinds of things that we're gathering together to study the Word of God. But the Word of God needs to be personally appropriated by you. It needs to be part of who you are. And, and so as we turn our attention now here to the really only purely offensive weapon that we've been given in this armor, uh, it is essential that we understand the place that the Word of God has in our lives. It's the reason that we as Calvary Chapel give great attention to God's Word. It, it's our pr principal reason for gathering together uh, as a church. When we, when we study, we're studying His Word. We're not studying my thoughts. We're studying His Word, and hopefully I won't mess it up uh, in sharing it with you. And so as we turn our attention, we'll be picking up in verse 17. And notice it says, take the helmet of salvation, referring to what we've already seen, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That weapon is a mighty weapon, family. That, that was the, the weapon of truth. And when you think about the girdle of truth, remember, in essence, you have in this weapon truth in truth. In other words, it's a double portion of this truth. That's how important the Word of God is in the life of a believer. And as you think on this, it's important to understand from the perspective when these things were written exactly what was being said about this particular weapon. Because there are two principal words that were used in the Greek language during those Roman times that referred to a, to a sword. Uh, the makaharia was a large, what we would call a battle sword, very large sword, sometimes weighed several pounds, had a single edge on it, and it was usually wielded with both hands. That was the type of sword when someone would go and they would actually, you know, attack a front line of the enemy's defenses. You would want something that could knock down a shield, you know, even maybe make a dent in someone's armor. And so there was a large battle sword. There is this another word that was used in the Greek language to describe these Roman weapons, and that is the rhema. The rhema was a very small sword. It was held inside of the waistband, and that sword had two edges on it, unlike the other sword, which had a single edge on it. And so as this word is used, two-edged, it's also important that we understand, because Hebrews tells us that that sword, the Word of God, is a two-edged sword. Amen? There in Hebrews chapter 4, what it says there is this, for the Word of God is living, in verse 12 of Hebrews 4. It is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged rema. That word two-edged means two-mouthed. It, it means to have dual voices. It doesn't just mean to have a couple of edges with which you can slash and cut. It, it, it means that it, it is able to speak any direction, in any time, anywhere in your life. And it was a short sword. It was for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was the major offensives are over. People are engaged. Our, our engagement with our enemy is close, and it's hand-to-hand. -hand. I, I, some of the, we were joking a little bit before service today. They asked that I would never, ever teach on spiritual warfare again because they've all been going through it because we've been studying it. So it's just like, oh, well, we'll put it to practice. 
Yeah, it, 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 that's the way it is. The enemy is going to come against you. The enemy is going to, to fight with you. The enemy is going to bring things into your life to where you're going to have to get down and dirty. You're going to have to get close. You're going to need to get in the trenches. And a big sword does you no good in that situation. Amen? You've you got to get in there and get after it. And so the writer of Hebrews says that that is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit between what we would call our mind, our mental capacity, and that which is spirit and where they meet, because the heart is the seat of where that happens. Amen? And, and so as the writer would say to us, between joints and marrow, look, it, it, it's, it, it's between the bone and what's inside of the bone. It gets to the very uh, densest part of who we are as human beings. It's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And so the Word of God is able to do what physical weapons can't. It's able to do what simple mental gymnastics can't. The Word of God is powerful in our lives. And just as the Apostle Peter, as he's delivering there in Acts chapter 2, he, he delivers this incredible message to this crowd. It's on the day of Pentecost, and here Peter preaches this sermon. And he, he looks to them, he says, And now when they heard this in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard this, the Word, they were cut to the heart. It just sliced through all the stuff, every bit of their defense, all the things that were going on in their lives that day. And Peter said to the rest of the disciples, men and brethren, what shall we do with these things? That's the power of the word of God to transform, to change, to speak into our lives things that sometimes we don't want to hear. Amen? I don't know about you, but in my Bible, there's stuff in there I don't like. Love my en What? Love my enemies? That's not an easy one to do. Amen? There's some stuff in there that when you, you like, really? And praise God that it's the power of God that gives the ability to, to take the word of God and wield it. Amen? And so the word of God in the life of the believer. And, and, and see, a physical sword. Peter tried using a physical sword, didn't he, to defend Jesus? Isn't that what he did initially? He took out that same physical sword, you know, if you want to look at it that way. It was the same type of sword, and he lops off the high priest Malchus's ear. He said, look, I'll, I'll just defend you with, with my arm of flesh. And as a believer, the ar arm of flesh isn't going to do very well in a spiritual situation. You need the Word of God. We need the Word of God. Moses did the same thing in Exodus chapter 2. He, he tried to defend God's character with an actual sword. Didn't work. The word alone was enough. The word alone was enough. Remember what happened? He's, he's going to slash and cut. And he, eventually he's going to get in trouble because of his temper. And it was actually the word of God that delivered him. Because when he met with God, God said, Hey, look, when you go see Pharaoh, just tell him I am that I am sent you. What? Couldn't I just take a gun or something? I am going to Pharaoh's house. No, the word of God is sufficient. The word of God is what we need. It's an interesting comparison because the more you use a physical sword, the duller it gets. Amen? Yeah, if you've got your little hatchet and your chopping firewood, maybe you've got your machete and you're out there wailing away at your you know, stuff in your yard. It gets dull with use, but not so the Word of God. The Word of God, that spiritual sword, actually gets sharper the more you use it. The more you take it out and say, thus says the Lord, this applies to my life, here's what God's Word says about it, that settles it for me, I'm going to do exactly that, it actually becomes sharper in your life. You see, the physical sword requires your hand the spiritual sword requires his hand. The physical sword wears out because it's you. The spiritual sword never wears out because it's him. And we need to remember this because as we wield the sword, this offensive weapon that we have to slash back at the enemy's attacks in our lives, 
We, we actually have the power of God available to us. We're going to see that in a moment in the life of the Lord himself. When the Lord was tempted, and if you want to turn there, you can actually go to that passage there in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, we'll pick up in verse 1. I'm going to look at probably the first 13 verses there. Notice what it says in Luke 1, or Luke 4, verse 1. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the, the only Son of God being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led, again, by the Spirit. Notice it's a spiritual battle. This isn't a physical battle. This isn't because the Romans were so powerful. It wasn't because the Jewish Sanhedrin had really come up with an amazing plan to try and entrap him. It was a spiritual battle. The enemy was after him. But notice he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He's actually led out to do battle with the enemy. He was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He has a personal encounter with Satan himself. Jesus, in the midst of that battle, in that intense fighting, after he spent 40 days in the wilderness, he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's no doubt malnourished, he probably hasn't slept well. All the things that you and I could think about physically, our lives are like that, amen? We have stuff going on, amen? Sometimes you don't sleep well. If you have children, you, that's part of being a parent, amen? When they're younger, they won't let you sleep, and when they're older, you can't sleep because you, you're, you're worrying about them, you're caring about them. Maybe you got something going on at work and you're just mulling those things over. You're like, man, I don't know when my job's going to, I don't know how I'm going to take care of my family. There is a battle going on in probably everyone's life in this room. We have stuff going on. And we get run down, we get beat up, we get attacked. And it's in that time that the enemy comes against you principally in your mind. Well, God doesn't love you. There is no God. Matter of fact, you're missing out because you're not doing the things that everyone else is doing in the world. That whole church thing, that is a bunch of hocus and pocus. And there he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. In those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. I love the fact that that is included by Dr. Luke. You know, when you're beat up and you're beat down and you're downtrodden, the enemy will attack you. He doesn't play fair. Can I tell you the enemy does not play fair? When you're going through stuff, he will heap more stuff on the top of the stuff that you're already going through. That's the way he works. He says, look, you're weak. I'll beat you up a little more. Maybe you'll give in. So don't be surprised that while you're already dealing with one thing, another thing is added to that because the enemy wants to destroy you. And the best way he can do that is to get you to give up, to surrender, to say, I'm not fighting anymore. I'm going to put down the sword of the... I'm not even going to try. Look at these three areas that Jesus was attacked in, and I want to focus on these a little bit. Notice that in every way that you and I are similar to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. Amen? Notice what's attacked here. Verse 3, Luke chapter 4. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, of course, I believe Satan knew exactly who Jesus was. But Jesus, in his physical being completely human and being very hungry from not having eaten for 40 days, he was hungry. And there are times when you're going to go through want. You're going to go through need. You're going to be beat up. You're going to be looking at the very last scraps of whatever it is that you need in your life, and the enemy is going to come against you as well, against your body. Maybe you've been going through a physical ailment. Maybe you've had something that's ongoing. Maybe something new in your life. You've contracted some type of 
maybe it's a cancer. Perhaps you've got a heart issue. Maybe you now have MS. Maybe you're struggling physically. The enemy's going to come in. See, God doesn't love you. And Jesus answered and said to him, Notice this, underline it, circle it, look at the three times this is said, for it is written. If Jesus found it appropriate, needful, necessary, absolutely spot on to use the word of God against the attacks of the enemy, how much more so do you think you need to know the word of God? Jesus does battle with the enemy of our souls by the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. Amen. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Look, here's, here's the story. Oh, you can come against my body. Yes, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten. But you know what? Life is more than bread. Life is more than what you will wear. Life is more than the things that you possess. Life is more than the physical body and the physical world that you live in. And so Jesus, fighting back against that attack on his physical being, uses the word of God. Secondarily, verse 5, and then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain. You see, because all of us, Jesus even showing us in his own life, because remember, he was in full submission to God the Father, amen? He was fully God, Jesus Christ the Son, but in full submission to God the Father, he said, I have come to do my Father's work, amen? He, he said, I have come here to, to bring my, the, the Father's kingdom, and so look what he says. The devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. He, he says, look, here, here's like, you know, maybe he showed him the U.S. of A, what it would look like. We don't know, but we know this. He showed him every kingdom. Here's the Roman kingdom. Maybe the Chinese kingdoms. Maybe he was showing the czar kingdoms of Russia. Maybe he was showing the Ottoman Turk Empire. Maybe the Greek, we don't know. But all of the kingdoms, everything. He says, look at all these amazing things that mankind will link together to accomplish. They'll make worldly kingdoms. And behind all those kingdoms, the enemy himself. Shows him all the kingdoms in a moment in time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory. Isn't, isn't that what we're tested with each and every day? Here's the world. Here's the glory of the world. There's the kingdoms of the world. There's the stuff that you can get. Just follow after the world. Look at what you can get if you do it the world's way. Isn't that thrust in front of your face every single day? Every day the enemy says, well, if you just do things the world's way, your life will get better. Just, just trade in that spouse. It's a high mileage vehicle. Don't worry about your kids. After all, they're 18. They can take care of themselves. It's all about you. You take care of yourself. Look, I'll give you everything. Just serve yourself. You do what you think pleases you. All this, the world and all of its glory, for this has been delivered to me. And notice that he was actually being truthful. The enemy uses a mixture of truth and lie. Very rarely will you get an outright just in your face lie. It's almost always a little bit of truth and some lie. So you've got to make it look good. You see, all this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. And therefore, Satan says, if you will worship before me, all of this will be yours. Notice the Lord's response. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for, again, underline it, circle it, highlight it, it is written. 
What does he fight back with? Now the issue is worship. Now the issue is the spirit. Now the issue is that spiritual realm. He fights back in the worldly realm, the physical realm with the word, now in the spiritual realm. For you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus uses the word to tackle a spiritual problem. How much more so do you think we need to use the word when Satan comes against you? Because, see, you have to choose each day whom you're going to serve, amen? You have, to, you have to yourself decide because you're going to get offered, you will get offered other choices. You're going to get offered other choices in the workplace. You're going to get offered other choices at school. You will get offered other choices choices in your friendships there will be other choices for you to make choose from you have to choose whether you're going to worship God or whether you're going to worship something else or someone else notice verse 9 now body spirit notice the next attack you, as a human being, are three parts. You're a physical body, you have a mind, and you have a spirit. Jesus addresses all three parts. And then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him inside the pinnacle of the temple. On the south side of the temple, there's a tower, Tower of David. The top of that pinnacle overlooking the whole city of Jerusalem, he said to him, If you were the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now notice a little difference between the other two attacks and this one. Satan now quotes, it is written. It's what all the cults do. They take a little bit of the word and a whole lot of lie. They take some truth, but they yank it out of context. They divest it from its true meaning Satan says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot to the stone. Don't forget that the enemy also knows what the word of God says. And he loves to twist the words of God. And so many people fall for it. They get a little bit of Bible and a whole lot of baloney. I personally happen to like fried bologna sandwiches, so I'm not anti bologna in Jesus' name. <laughs> Notice what Jesus now says, verse 12, and Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not. Notice how he retorts to this. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Who is Satan speaking to? Jesus, and who is he? He's God. Amen? Amen? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. That's why he could say, get behind me. And now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. He would come back. But the word of God wielded is sufficient for the attacks of the enemy. Whether those attacks come to your mind, or whether they come to your body, your person, or whether they come to your spirit, it is the word of God that you can use to slash back when the enemy comes at you. Wield the sword well. As you notice here in verse 10, Satan says it is written. He, he's mimicking, he's mocking. He's saying, look, uh, you know, I can do that. Uh, two can play that game. You can almost hear him saying it. But I want you to notice something. He doesn't quote completely. He doesn't apply it correctly, and he takes it completely out of context. That's the attack that will normally come against you. Neil Moody wisely said, you can prove anything by the Bible. And that's true. If you don't quote completely, if you do not 
apply it correctly and if you yank it out of context. I used to love arguing a little bit with the students at the Bible college, and one of the questions, you know, I would usually give them an, uh, an exercise. Okay, I want you to go find some bizarre scripture, and I want you to make an argument against something in your life. One of their favorite ones was Isaiah uh, chapter 5, and it says there in verse 11, Woe to those who rise early in the morning. <laughs> and they would use that quoted impartially, incorrectly, and out of context to explain why they were late for every class. <laughs> now, see, you might want to read the rest of that because it says that they might follow intoxicating drink who continue in tonight until the wine inflames them. It's actually speaking about a party mentality in recreational drinking. Taken out of context, pull it out of its central meaning, don't use it correctly, you can prove almost anything. Don't fall for it. You need to be Bereans. You need to read your Bibles. Believe it or not, people use John 3.16 in the same manner. They quote the first half of the verse, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. As if that were a statement. Oh, that's not what it says, is it? That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you don't get the emphasis on belief, look what falls at verse 17. For he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. For he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, the focus in that verse is actually on believing, isn't it? Not just that God is a gracious God, that God is a sovereign God. You need to know the Word. And when you know the Word, when the enemy comes at you, when you're, when, whether it's an issue of his sovereignty or it's an issue of you being tested and tried, whether it's an issue of some moral thing in your life or whether it's some temptation that you're undergoing, the answer is the Word of God. You can fight back with the Word of God. And so to that end, the Lord, the Lord is these things in us, amen, if you want to look at it that way. And as we close, in that sense, the whole, whole armor of God is this. Isn't Jesus Christ himself truth? Amen? He's truth. Is he not our righteousness? He is our righteousness. You're not righteous. He's righteous for you. You get his righteousness, not your own. He is our peace. He's the one that made peace with God the Father. Amen? The Word tells you these things. So when you don't have peace, you need to remember what the Word says. Jesus Christ has made peace for you. You have peace. It is his faithfulness that makes possible our faith. Think about it for a second. You wouldn't have the ability to even have faith if he didn't give it to you as a gift. That's why you have peace, because he gave you faith so that you could believe. It's not a mental exercise. It's not something, well, if you just figure out all these spiritual truths, somehow, boink, the light goes on. He gives you the gift of faith. Jesus, in fact, is your salvation, amen? No Jesus, no salvation. So that helmet that you're wearing that protects your mind, that's because he died in your place. And he is, in fact, the word of God itself. In the beginning was the? And the wor word was? And the word was? Amen? He's the word. So if you want the Word active in your life, focus on the Word. If you want to see Him in new and wonderful ways, take in the Word of God. Put it on as Colossians reminds us. Remember that wonder, put on the new man. Put on Jesus. Put on the Word. Put on those tender, those things that come from Him. And as you do that, you can stand strong in what he is doing in your life through the word of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
for the power of the word. And we pray that we would wield that sword when the enemy comes seeking to destroy and kill and maim and mess with us, do his work in our lives. We pray that we'd have the sword at the ready, Lord, that that waist belt of truth would also have the sword of truth tucked in it. And when he comes, would we just take that sword out and cut down that vain argument that he'll make against you. Lord, would you use your word to strengthen us as your people? Would you bless us? Would you anoint us, Lord? We, we need the power of your word working in our lives. We thank you for it, that you haven't left us as orphans, Lord, but you've given us uh, your strong word that we might be able to stand in these last days. And so, God, we give you our lives fresh and new. Pray, Lord, that you would work in us to accomplish your great pleasure. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.